So hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful lecture session from the horror programme at the University of the Underground. I'm Aggie Haynes, I'm head of the horror programme which is a critical exploration into illicit societal fears and human passion for horror. We're going to be investigating institutions and popular culture through the lens of the horror genre in dramaturgy, film, costume making and more. The University of the Underground is a free, pluralistic and transnational university founded in 2017 and birthed in the basements of nightlife venues. So we're a non-profit and registered charity. If you'd like to donate, please visit um, universityoftheunderground.org. On, on this website, you can find amazing, exciting programming times and events. And you can also find a lot of other content on our Instagram page. So we're super excited to be joined today by Jennifer Wallace. Um, so Dr. Jennifer Wallace is a lecturer in history of science and medicine and medical humanities teaching fellow at Imperial College London. She's especially interested in the history of psychiatry in the 19th century, medical technologies and the history of the body. Her publications include Investigating the Body in the Victorian Asylum, Doctors, Patients and Practices, Open Access, if this is online, um, I'll send you the link afterwards, um, and the co-authored volume Anxious Times, Medicine and Modernity in 19th Century Britain. So Jennifer also writes on music and film. She's the editor of Fight Your Own War, Power, Electronics and Noise Culture from Head Press, and a contributor to the recently published Shocking Cinema of the 70s, to which she contributed a chapter on rape revenge narratives in made for TV movies. So beyond her academic work, she can be found behind the scenes at indie publisher Head Press. And I'm gonna put the link uh, in the chat on the side so you can check it out later. Jennifer, thank you, feel free to take it away. Thank you so much, Aggie, and thanks for that lovely introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. So do tell me if this doesn't work as it should, but hopefully you can all see that. So um, thank you so much for having me. And um, you've got me talking about something that I've worked on for quite a long time. Uh, so this was the subject of my PhD and it's kind of never gone away. And I started researching uh, these things in uh, 2010 ish and whenever I mentioned to people that I was researching the Victorian asylum people tended to have a certain perception of it uh, they would say something like oh they were terrible places or they used to lock up unwed mothers and this kind of thing and although that is applicable in some cases the picture is much more varied much more nuanced than simply bad treatment or locking people away who were considered to be undesirable in some way. And the 19th century in particular is really interesting because this is the period when there are concerted efforts to reform the asylum system, uh, to increase the provision that they offer. And it also seems to be a period where insanity was increasing as well. And the reasons for that were debated uh, fiercely by doctors at the time. So today then, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is first look into uh, some brief context about the 19th century asylum system. Um, if you don't know anything about it, this is um, a huge field, a huge literature. So I'm being quite ambitious in condensing it into about five or 10 minutes. And I'll also tell you something about the history of pathology and postmortems in psychiatry. I'll look at a couple of examples from my own research about how postmortem research actually affected patient treatments and care in the asylum. And finally, I'll just say a little bit about photographs, about ethics and the role of the historian. And I think this is a really interesting topic as a whole because of course the idea of things like postmortems and sinister pathologists and surgical treatments in asylums is something that has been a horror trope in many many um, films and hopefully by the end you'll we'll maybe be able to think a bit differently about those tropes and the realities behind them. So some very brief context then. In Britain in the first half of the 19th century, there was 
a wave of new legislation that aimed to control how asylums were run and how their patients were treated. And at first, the government tries to encourage local authorities to build an asylum for their local population. And later, they compel them to do so. So there's a really key piece of legislation in 1845 called the Lunacy Act. Uh, lunacy and insanity and um, common words at this time. And as historians, we use terminology of the time that we're talking about. This 1845 Lunacy Act actually requires all local authorities to build an asylum for their pauper insane. So those who would not be paying for their treatment. At the same time as this, you do have private asylums where the better off could go, and these would tend to be almost like a house where you wouldn't have too many patients, you would pay for your treatments, it would be um, a slightly different kind of experience. And so this act as well also introduces inspectors, uh, the commissioners in lunacy, who are to go around and check that asylums are being run as they should be. And in order to do that, you need administration and bureaucracy. And so when you have this centralized system introduced, there are a whole host of things like case books and post-mortem records and admission registers that make this system run. And we might uh, discuss those in terms of paper technologies. This is an idea that some historians of science and technology have worked on a lot. And these are vital components of this new asylum system, these new paper technologies like the case book that you can see there. So um, you probably do not envy me um, several years of trying to decipher the handwriting in some of these books. It was always a relief when you turn the page and you had the doctor who could write legibly. And so when reading the literature on paper technologies, the things that have been written by historians about these things, a word that frequently crops up is mundane. The medical record is described as a mundane technology. And, and when we look up dictionary definitions of the mundane, we find things like very ordinary or lacking interest or excitement. But at the same time, the mundane can refer um, to, to denote the earthly as opposed to the spiritual realm and seems to have much broader potential when you think of the mundane in that kind of sense, where it is defined as being something that is of the world or characteristic of the world. And I think that tension between the mundanity of bureaucracy, the messiness of the outside world, and the difficulty of capturing people's interior mental lives is really encapsulated in asylum records because these are places where reason and unreason and reality and fantasy coexist. And so for many years, if you look at histories that have been written of the asylum, at first they were very much focused on what we might call the social history of the asylum. Things like the experiences of patients and their families, the everyday lives of these institutions, the way that power operates within the psychiatric encounter, and also the stigma surrounding mental illness. And that drive to place patients at the center of that historical narrative has been very productive. But I think sometimes it has also had an unintended effect of erasing from that history a lot of the scientific work that went on in psychiatry. And this is really the area that I got interested in. Pathology, the study of disease via bodily tissues and organs, and particularly the post-mortem and the examination of the body after death. And I think that by focusing on things like pathology in the asylum, we can actually uncover really vivid details of patient experiences and also doctors' experiences, which are equally um, important to this story. And of course, much laboratory research and much um, pathological research informed patient care as well. So this isn't 
irrelevant to that social history story. So you might be thinking then, okay, but where does pathology come into the asylum? Do these things start off as places where people are very interested in doing these kind of post-mortem examinations and pathological work? There was a long-standing interest in what people referred to as the pathology of insanity. The 18th century Italian anatomist Morgagni was examining the bodies of insane patients in the 18th, uh, 17th and 18th century. And in France, the Inspector General of Asylums was writing about his pathological investigations of the brain in the uh, 1830s, 1840s. A lot of that early work actually relies not on human material to do those investigations, but on animals. But of course, human bodies were preferable. And the 19th century is key again here because this is the century where a really uh, seminal piece of legislation is passed. So previously, if you wanted to get a body um, as a doctor or an anatomist, you wanted a body to dissect, you would generally have the body of a criminal, somebody who had been hanged for a capital crime. This changes in 1832 with the Anatomy Act. And this is a, re a response really to the fact that there don't seem to be enough bodies to go round for anatomists to do their research. And so this act makes it possible for the bodies of anyone who is not claimed by their friends or their family and who has died in a public institution like a workhouse or a public hospital to be used for anatomical teaching and research. And so when you have this legislation, asylums are one of those public institutions as well. So if you were not claimed um, by your family, then you could be uh, used for research and further study. And as interest in pathology really uh, burgeons throughout the 19th century, the bodies of asylum patients are increasingly prized by psychiatrists because they're seen as being very valuable in terms of telling people something about mental illness, about the brain. And psychiatrists, um, not just in Germany, but elsewhere, are following what was called the German model. And this was where pathological research and post-mortem investigation was becoming more systematized and actually divided between chronic asylums where you had very ill patients who were unlikely to get well and acute units, which were generally attached to a regular hospital. So they weren't a psychiatric hospital. And that German model of dividing your care between the chronic and the acute is very influential. And it's something that people try to adopt in other areas as well, including in Britain. And as you can see, I, I really recommend this book if you're interested in that, that um, German system and German psychiatry in this period. But I'm going to focus on, on Britain. And so in the second half of the 19th century, then there were quite a few attempts to make pathological work and postmortems more routine in asylums. The commissioners in lunacy, this inspection type body, they increasingly seemed to believe that pathology was something that was important to gain knowledge of mental illness and not just to do things like explain what had caused a particular patient's death. And in the 1870s, there was actually a call by some of the profession to make postmortems compulsory in all British asylums. But that actually failed, that didn't happen. And so the way that, play, that um, these institutions conducted postmortems and how many they did and so on was really very variable. So at some institutions to do a postmortem, they would be very clear about getting the permission of the family and the friends beforehand. And they would often do that by casting that postmortem as being something for the greater good, 
saying that this will help more people in the future. But at the same time, these bodies were often viewed as the property of the institution as well. And the opportunity to register your objection to a postmortem if you were a family member outside the asylum might also not be particularly easy, especially if you were not literate. You couldn't read the letter that you were sent by the asylum telling you about this plan. And occasionally when I look in the postmortem records of the asylums that I work in, it's really interesting to occasionally see annotations that say things like, family permit only the thorax to be examined, or family do not permit the head to be examined. So it's clear that families also had a sense of how much um, investigation they were willing to allow doctors to do on their loved ones. But in any case, um, despite all this variation, by the turn of the century, by about 1900, psychiatry in Britain was pretty confident in presenting itself as a discipline that was based on empirical observation and on scientific investigation, both of the living and the dead. One asylum that was really renowned for this work and is the one that I worked on in particular was the West Riding in Wakefield in Yorkshire in the north of England. This asylum opens in 1818. It's one of the first um, of the very big asylums in Britain to be built. And this site becomes the center really of a gradually expanding network of asylums in this area. There's another one in Sheffield, there's another in Leeds that all form this, this larger whole. And a bit like other asylums like Clayberry in London, this, this one, the West Riding Asylum, really makes the pathological study of mental disease a regular part of its operations. It becomes really embedded in the institution's character. This is one of my favorite pictures um, from that archive. This is their pathology lab, which was an updated um, version that they had installed in 1894. This asylum is one of the first to actually have a dedicated pathology lab to appoint a paid pathologist to the staff. And it also published its own scientific journal for several years as well. There were several superintendents too. Um, superintendents were kind of the, the managers, if you like, of the asylum. And there were several who were very interested in scientific work. And so they pushed this as well. And this asylum in particular becomes a real, if you wanted to do scientific research in psychiatry, you went to the West Riding to do some training even if it was only for a short period of time. And it, it even informs work like um, Charles Darwin's. So he was in correspondence with one of the superintendents there. And if you look at his um, book, Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals from the 1870s, he based some of, of his observations and ideas on the conversations that he had with James Crichton Brown, who was the superintendent of this place at the time. So, you might be thinking, well, OK, what does all this mean for the patients then? And so I want to pull out two examples of how pathological work influenced ideas about care and treatment in my own work. The first one is one that I've actually discussed in more depth elsewhere in an article and also in the book. And if you would like those references at the end, please do just ask. And this was the issue of bone fractures amongst asylum patients. So in the 1870s, a lot, or maybe not a lot, but several British asylums came under scrutiny in the press. You can see these newspaper clippings. They were coming under scrutiny for deaths in their institutions that seemed to have one disturbing feature in common. And that was that the, the patients had either broken or fractured ribs. Letters come into newspapers from people who say that they were an asylum attendant, like a nurse, and authors and also journalists who say that the reason for these rib breakages is that the attendants in trying to subdue excited patients are literally kneeling on the patient's chest. 
and causing these injuries. And this debate really touches upon broader issues that had really um, followed the asylum system throughout its entire life, which was the supposed bad character of asylum attendants who worked in these places. And also this very thorny issue of how to deal with patients who were violent without restraining them, without doing something like manually um, tying their hands or something like that. And this scandal is really interesting um, from a pathological point of view, because it opens up a really clear space for pathological expertise to be inserted into this debate. Because in many of these cases, doctors are saying that patients who have died in these circumstances tend to be the patients with the same diagnosis. They tend to be patients who have general paralysis of the insane. That was a, a very common uh, condition at the time in the late 19th century. And it's generally understood now to refer to neurosyphilis. So when syphilis infection has um, occurred and then several years later, it, the illness can resurface in a very marked way that affects the brain. And that was the condition actually that I focused on throughout uh, my PhD. And to contemporary doctors, they found this condition, general paralysis, really exciting in a way as much as it was tragic, because it had so many different symptoms, both physical and mental, that they thought, well, if you can figure out what causes general paralysis, you can probably figure out every other mental illness that we see. It was seen as this model that would tell you everything about how the brain worked. And when they looked at the postmortems of these kind of patients, then uh, when they're looking uh, at these, these deaths where there seem to be uh, rib fractures, they often call attention to the softened state of the ribs, to a diseased condition of the ribs. Some of them are describing them as so uh, soft that you can just press them with a finger and they will fracture. And whether that is the case or not is not my concern as a historian. But what I am interested in is how that debate is seized upon by asylum doctors as a way to demonstrate their, the value of their pathological research. Because if you could show definitively that these broken ribs were because these patients had an abnormally fragile body, then asylum pathologists would show that they were relevant um, in a much broader capacity than just within their little laboratory. And they would also potentially be able to absolve those attendants of the charges that were being made against them. But of course, you couldn't just simply say, oh, well, I saw this in a postmortem. You had to have some more quantifiable kind of proof. And so lots of asylum researchers start to capitalize on their lab spaces to try and investigate this fracture issue in more detail. One of the doctors who investigates this is Charles Mercier. And he was a man who had worked in these public pauper asylums before going into private practice. Interestingly, he also had um, a degenerative bone disease himself. And in the early 1890s, he comes up with this device that he says will test and will precisely quantify the breaking strain of the rib at postmortem. So he has this device manufactured in small quantities and he sends it to several asylums and asks them to experiment and to send him their results. One of the asylums he sends it to is the West Riding. And the device makes its way into the hands of a medical officer there. He uses that testing device in 122 postmortems. And when you look at the asylum's postmortem records, you can see that that became a regular test with um, a little number telling you what the breaking strain was of the ribs in each case. But it also leads to um, some quite interesting innovations 
where when I was flicking through all these books, um, suddenly when I got to about mid-1895, while they were experimenting with this device, they start to insert a little slip into the top of the page, and you can see the text of it there. And it's really a reminder to the person filling in the record that in every case, you can see just in the middle there, they must describe the state of the ribs. And so this was clearly such a concern, this very specific post-mortem appearance, that it was tied into much broader ideas about proving the care of patients accounting for their treatment and also accounting for things like whether restraint had been used. The Medico Psychological Association, so this is like the professional body of psychiatrists at the time, they have a handbook for the instruction of attendance on the insane and that also um, incorporates these kind of ideas, this research that is going on because they emphasize to it, their readers that they should never place their knees on a patient's body to subdue them. Charles Mercier also writes his own handbook um, and he, he talks about how attendants can spot a rib fracture by things like the patient shrinking away from contact. So the utility of these breaking strain instruments and these experiments was questioned by some people. But what I think is interesting about them is that they really demonstrate the sense of innovation that was in some of these asylums in the 19th century. Mercier's breaking strain instrument sits alongside some other innovations that attempted to really systematize and to enhance the pathological work in the asylum. So we have things like um, brain slates, which were basically a, a small blackboard with a, a painted diagram of the brain on, and you could use chalk to fill in the areas where there might be a lesion or an unusual appearance. And then when you finished, you'd wipe them clean and you'd use it again for the next case. There was something called a tephrolometer, uh, which was basically a hollow glass tube that you could use to measure how deep the brain substance was. And that my personal favorite was the doctor at the West Riding who um, wanted to find something different than plaster of Paris to make casts of the skull, of the interior of the skull. And instead he goes to the local printer's shop in the town and he gets this mixture of glue and treacle, which he says works much better. But it's that kind of innovation with instruments I think, that really looms large in the popular perception of psychiatrists past. We think often about these doctors doing pointless and unnecessary interventions that invariably cause harm to the patient, um, almost like some kind of Frankenstein's laboratory. And it is important to note that not all doctors at the time thought that pathology was the answer to mental disease. Uh, many are saying, well, why would I spend my time doing this when I could be observing the patient while they were alive and making them more comfortable while they were alive? There was one intervention that generated particular comment in this regard, and it was one that, again, uh, stemmed from post-mortem observations, which were then used to try and figure out a treatment. And again, this involves general paralytic patients. So in 1890, there were two doctors at Banstead Asylum who write a piece in the British Medical Journal, which still exists today, about a man in their care with general paralysis who had really crippling headaches, really, really terrible headaches, which was quite common in that condition. And these two doctors think about their experiences of the postmortems that they've done on people with this condition. And they think, well, they always seem to have a large amount of excess fluid inside the skull. And so perhaps this is causing pressure and causing this headache. So they turn to something which has been used for many um, centuries. Um, this particular procedure has been found on um, skulls that are hundreds of years old 
and they make two tripping holes in his skull. And a few days later, they claim that this patient's headache has gone and also that some of his other symptoms have become less bad, including his delusions. These two doctors are by no means the first to attempt uh, surgery on the brain in living patients. In the 19th century, uh, craniectomies were often performed in significant numbers on children that had been diagnosed with idiocy. That was a term that in the 19th century encompassed a whole range of conditions, uh, right from things like epilepsy to mild learning disabilities. And the whole um, the vocabulary um, of this time is incredibly interesting in terms of how it morphs and changes and how it's then passed into everyday language. So trepanation or trepinning made logical sense to those two doctors. They had seen that there was fluid in the skull and they thought if you let it out, you will relieve the symptoms. And it also relied on principles that had been used in long established procedures like bleeding patients to get rid of excess blood or to blister them uh, to set up some kind of counter irritation. But following that article that they write in the British Medical Journal, the journal receives a number of letters that want to debate the ethics of this kind of procedure. And some write in to say, well, general paralytic patients are very fragile anyway, they're very clumsy, they're very unsteady on their feet, it's hard for them to look after themselves. And so it's hardly justifiable to do an operation like this, which might give them you know, further opportunity to injure themselves or to develop an infection. At the West Riding, um, I found one case of trepanation on a female patient, Elizabeth Ann, in 1893. And the, su the success of that procedure was debatable. So she was discharged two months after, apparently much improved, but she returns to the asylum several months later. And it's quite um, telling when you read her casebook record that some of the um, delusions that the doctors report are things like she had died and come to life again that she was afraid that she would have done something done to her, which do not seem entirely unreasonable delusions given what she had um, been through. She dies in the asylum four years later, uh, having spent much of her time there just wandering the wards, not speaking. When you look at her post-mortem record, the doctor who's doing that procedure mentions that the extent of changes in the brain is much less than what he would normally expect in a case of general paralysis and so it suggests that that trepanation procedure even though it didn't cure her seemed to have done something but it's very hard to look at a case like that one and to gloss over the very real tragedy at the heart of it this is a woman who spent the last four years of her life silently wandering the corridors of an asylum. But I think the case is important in revealing something about the role of surgical intervention in the history of psychiatry. We tend to think about things like trepanation, which is a, seems a very drastic procedure, as some kind of misguided attempt at curing the patient. But the possibility of cure, particularly in general paralysis, was rarely, if ever, suggested by contemporary doctors. And neither, I think, can we see these kind of interventions simply as a wanton experiment. Rather, doctors viewed something like trepanation through the lens of palliative care, almost, or of a temporary relief from symptoms, which was not insignificant when you had a very chronic condition like general paralysis. And so bone fractures and trepanation are just two examples um, of how pathological research could inform treatment in psychiatry. And I guess both at first sight seem to really confirm that, that knee-jerk reaction to Victorian psychiatry. Uh, there are violent asylum attendants somewhere in that story, there are asylums filled with chronic incurable cases. There are doctors performing um, these rather gothic procedures. 
But these things also, and I discuss this um, more thoroughly in the book, formed part of a much larger investigative enterprise that tried to investigate almost every part of the asylum patient's body, particularly when you had a, a thing like general paralysis, which affected thousands of people in the asylum population. These different ways of seeing that disease were multiple and constantly evolving and included things like bacteriology and photography and each of those different techniques and technologies contributed to and developed the knowledge that people had of this condition. And so the place where we perhaps seem to come closest to patients and their experiences is via the photograph. And the representational capacity of photographs would be a whole other paper in itself. But I think this is an interesting area where it seems like patients are most present uh, in a way, but they are equally also most visibly constrained in photographs from asylums by the literal framing of the picture, by um, asylum uniforms, and sometimes even by the hands of attendants that you can see from outside the frame, often on the patient's shoulder. And like the case books, photographs were a really vital element of this new bureaucratic system in the asylums. Uh, and a, a large asylum like the West Riding would photograph every patient upon admission, and that picture would be stuck into their case book record. And they were a means of identifying patients in a very large institution, but also a way of identifying people if they happen to abscond from the asylum. They might be used by some people as proof of mental disease. There was an idea that you could perhaps read in people's faces what exactly was wrong. And you can see in that example there that um, this woman has monomania of pride. And some doctors are actually using photographs almost as therapeutic tools as well to shock their patients into realizing how ill they are and showing them before and after pictures. And the use and the reuse of photographs in historical work and particularly historical medical photographs like this one, but I've also worked extensively with pathological photographs as well, including post-mortem photographs, this issue has only recently begun to be discussed by historians in terms of the ethical aspects of that use. The photograph was really celebrated by Victorian observers as capturing things as they really were. And I think the photograph still tricks us into thinking that these are somehow truer representations than the casebook text notes that they often accompany because here are the doctor's notes, but here in front of us, right there looking back at us is the patient. And one of the West Riding um, patients that I worked on was photographed in 1895 on account of him having very um, severe psoriasis on his whole body. And he was photographed nude, side on to the camera, in front of um, a canvas backdrop, almost like a studio backdrop of a woodland scene behind him. And the photograph for me demonstrated both the role of photography as a mode of representation in the asylum and also the doctor's interest in skin conditions. And I was free with the archives permission to reproduce that photograph in my book because it was 120 years old or thereabouts at that point. And I did reproduce it along with a brief uh, discussion of how I'd come to the decision to do so. And I think if I went back now and I did that book again, I probably wouldn't use it. I wouldn't include it. Um, because I think on the one hand, we might argue that over time patients are somehow liberated from the outdated representations of themselves that are held in these records. But on the other, we have to recognize how our own representation of that image dislocates it from its original context and can impose new meanings on it. And so when I deal with those 
um, those representations, those photographs, whether I use them in publications or I use them in a talk like this one, I am also dealing in those representations. And this is a situation that uh, Jane Nicholas, I think, writes about fantastically in her article about freak show photography. And she handles a photograph in an archive of two children from an early 20th century American sideshow whose skin condition had led them to being exhibited as the elephant skinned boys. And she writes, I hold in my hands evidence of exploited bodies that implicates me in the legacies of inequality and vulnerability. And I think what I really like about Nicholas, um, and you, whether you agree or disagree with this idea of um, exhibiting historical medical photographs, she highlights how the historian takes something of the archive out into the world with them. And in doing so, perhaps there's some kind of responsibility for that. And um, I also, um, if you read one book um, that I, I mentioned today, and um, there's a references slide at the end, Alec Barge's The Allure of the Archives is an absolutely fantastic read. Um, and I love this line from her where she says, when a reader in the archives examines what happened during an event, she tells it and undoes it at the same time. And so the patient first graph, I think, although it clearly illustrated for me lots of contemporary aspects um, of asylum practice, it is typical of what Boris Jardine has called the flickering reality of paper, where it can morph into other things and it can look different in different lights. But I focus very much on pathology today. I wanted to get photography in there because it's the thing that really captures people's imagination and I think is incredibly interesting, but needs a whole other lecture to do it justice. And I think pathology is one of those things that when I talk about it has often um, made people sometimes feel a little uncomfortable because it seems to risk turning the patient simply into an object are into a body, a thing to be medically um, observed and dissected. But a lot of the, um, the investigations that I looked at um, in this research relied on a degree of collaboration between patients and doctors and sometimes families as well. And so by uncovering more of that science in the history of psychiatry, I don't necessarily think that means that we lose the social history of psychiatry because they are very much intertwined. And when I was reading through these kinds of patient records, it was really impossible to read those, even the most clinical and the most um, intricate technical details of postmortem procedures. It was impossible to read those without also thinking about the patient's experience as well as the doctor's. And so if you'd like to know more, um, if there's anything I've mentioned today, and um, this is just a tiny snippet um, of that research. So the book, as Aggie said, is open access, but if there's something in particular that you, you want to know more about, then please do feel free to get in touch with me because I would be very happy um, to answer any questions. And I'll share these slides with Aggie as well for you so that you have them, but I've added just a very short uh, recommended reading list there for you as well. So thank you so much for listening and very happy to answer any questions. Jennifer, thank you so much. It's so interesting. Thank you. Has, has anyone got any questions? Stunned into silence. <laughs> I have an absolute ton, so I maybe. <laughs> um, one thing I found really interesting was this thing that you were saying at the beginning about, um, you know, how how certain people would be gifted for research, and I I find it really interesting that like that it sets different values to people, right? That I I don't know whether this is a question or just a thought, but. I, is there anything that's has anyone ever commented on their themselves doing that? Is that something that people reflect on? Or you mean the doctors themselves? Yeah, 
I have I haven't come across any um, in this context, but there are a couple of historians who um, do, have done really amazing, extensive research on the history of dissection in this period. So there's Helen MacDonald and Ruth Richardson as well. Helen MacDonald's book, um, Human Remains, is fantastic. And I think it's her who, who talks about exactly that issue, where she says that, um, you know, this was um, that particular piece of legislation in 1832 was controversial because um, not amongst um, the doctors necessarily, but amongst um, people who had an interest in working class and labouring class politics, because this was the same time, the same decade where the Reform Act has come in, which has extended the right to vote to some people, but by no means to all, and it still does that on the basis of how much property you own. And it's also in 1834, you have something called the New Poor Law, which was this idea that for somebody to receive assistance from the state, they had to be willing to go into a workhouse. And so they had to be willing to go into somewhere quite um, unpleasant. And so the idea was, if people can work, then they will, you know, rather than um, just lay around. And it, it was all a whole, you know, it was the same as a kind of 1970s um, Thatcherite kind of argument. And um, th those bits of legislation are very much bound together. And Helen MacDonald talks about how that 1832 Act, I think the, the quote that she says is, it turned the bodies of the poor into useful things. Um, and there is also, if you look into that literature, the, probably the starkest place where you find that question of value is in things like um, the records of grave robbers. So there is um, a, a diary somewhere that is a diary of a resurrectionist, I think the title is, and I'm sure it's online somewhere where it, it specifies how much money they've received for each corpse that they've sold to the anatomist at the hospital. And it was quite a lucrative trade. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, as well, there's obviously this, we're, we're looking at horror and, and as you mentioned, there's horror in every part of the story. And mm. the, the researchers here are doing, so they're looking at natural horror, and using art horror as a means to sort of subvert natural horror. But I'm wondering, like, what do you think, what do you think it is that makes people who make art horror so interested in, in this topic? I know that might be an impossible question to answer, but is it just the general anxiety that this sort of era mm, I had? Think or? It's that Victorian Gothic thing, isn't it? Like, you know, you know, you can rely on the Victorians to have a, a strange idea about something, or, or you know, especially about death. Uh, and and we're more kind of we're closer to death as well, um, and perhaps more open to its realities than we were. And I, I think particularly, um, I've written about this elsewhere in a non-academic context. If you look at film and and films that are set in asylums, there's a real about turn from like the 80s, 90s, where before that, what is scary in a horror film that has an asylum theme is the patient, because the patient is unpredictable and mad and is going to kill everybody. Very simplistic uh, representation. And then when you get to the 90s, 2000s, it's the asylum building itself that is frightening. So in films like Session 9 or House on Haunted Hill, uh, the remake, they, they, the asylum becomes the malevolent thing that is going to get everybody. And I think that's because the asylum by that point has disappeared from popular consciousness. They, they closed down uh, most of the asylums in this country in the 80s, 90s, um, shifted to community care. And so they very quickly became these decrepit buildings that looked frightening and had these um, sinister connotations. But I also think there's something quite beautiful about those old buildings as well. These were really magnificent things, which had a lot of thought going to the design of them, particularly the early ones, where they had an idea that if you made a place look nice, it would help people's well-being and state of mind as well. Uh, and then when you look at them when they're decaying, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of urban exploration forums and photographs where people have gone into them and taken pictures of these sites. And there is something um, quite magnificent in them. 
Yeah, well, one of the, well, sorry, I have, does anyone else have anything before I reel off more questions? Kat? I have one, but you can go first, Aggie. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask you, by the way, really, really interesting topic. And um, yeah, it's super fascinating. And I really like the way at the end of that presentation, you kind of talked about the moral tension of these collecting these images and also how we examine them from our kind of 21st century perspective. Well, I mean, yeah, 21st century <laughs> perspective <laughs> and like how we see pathology as always a bad thing. I wonder if you have like come across any more modern kind of takes on that that can be compared with the time period that you're examining just because in previous research I've done before I've actually looked at a lot of like mental health pathology and kind of self pathologization oh. it, like sometimes it's kind of it can be positive because people want to be treated and like, it's not yeah. always like intention to subjectify someone yeah. to being just a body so yeah I yeah. wonder if you've like worked with anyone in a more modern context not really so I tend to yeah my comfort zone is the 19th century so I kind of stay in the 19th century for most of the time uh, but yeah I think I think there's something um very interesting like what you're talking about there makes me think of because there's a big um discussion within the history of psychiatry about um labels and diagnoses and a speak, particularly in the historical context one that gets talked about a lot is hysteria and the way that the hysteria label was applied to women as a kind of social control thing. But I think there's there's fewer people who are talking about things from the perspective of sometimes a diagnosis could be very comforting to a patient that you are, that here is what is wrong. And even if it is just a label with um, some kind of um, synopsis attached to it, it makes sense of something that is hard to make sense of and I think that sometimes comes through in the, the records that I've read where um, and especially from families sometimes you don't find many letters from families but I found a couple where they they are thanking the doctors for um, recognizing that something was wrong uh, and, and for putting a name to it almost and I think that probably is more prevalent in the 20th century um, but not something that I can think of an immediate example of it's very much like way outside my uh, comfort zone of time. <laughs> Anyone else? Could I perhaps ask something about uh, you so I suppose everyone here, I'm asking on behalf of everyone perhaps, but is at a stage where they're starting, you know, they're, they're collecting research mm. and you've done a lot of things like visiting archives. Um, how did you, firstly, how did you go about finding the places that you wanted to research and how, how did you go about structuring things that you'd found? So I know these are impossible. Mm. No, no. <laughs> but it's interesting to know your, how you went about doing it. So I think um, I had, I did all my secondary reading first. So I had a broad sense of the, um, of asylums in the 19th century and which ones I was interested in. It actually started off very different where what I wanted to do to start with was to look at male experiences of mental illness in the 19th century, because there's a lot on women and hysteria, but not so much on men. And it, it morphed quite quickly into what it is now what I've been talking about because I actually found um, a pathological photo album which just enraptured me and I wanted to figure out what was going on in it and so that one sort of really changed everything so I think um in terms of like search tips just being I mean be realistic I would say as well um I think one of the most difficult things is to accept that you've got enough stuff and how much stuff you actually need for the thing that you're doing. I think the worst bit of doing um, research like this is you will always, always find something else. And it's always, and I kept thinking, oh, I, I must add that in. And you've got to draw a line under it and say, I will stop. Um, but keyword searching um, various um, online archives. There are also, if, you look, if you're looking for vaguely historical or sociological material, I'd recommend sites like the Hazzy Trust. Um, I'll just type it in the chat. 
um, and archive.org as well, where there's lots of full text past um, things. They're, they're not very, you, you get things some, sometimes from the 1960s, 1970s, but those are really amazing things that are just completely freely accessible. In terms of um, medical things, I'm sure you've probably mentioned um, this one already in a previous session, Aggie, but the Welcome Library collections are really invaluable, um, both their text and their images. Um, there are probably other ones as well that I can think of. But yeah, searching those kind of things. I also find Google Scholar actually really helpful for keyword searching and finding things that I otherwise have not found um, has been more um, interesting and helpful than I would have anticipated. In terms of collecting the stuff, um, I used to have, I've still got them. I've got like files and files of Word docs on my um, computer, which are all slightly different. So I had a sense of the, the chapters and the sections I wanted. And so I would have a, a, a file for each one and stick stuff in there. Um, I also had, I've still got spreadsheets of, um, I think I've got 2,500 patient records from the admission registers with all their, <laughs> with all their admission information um, put into these spreadsheets, which I, I never used meaningfully, um, but is there. So I think just being, I don't know how useful this this, this uh, advice is, but having if you've got a sense of your sections, I think having things organised into those sections is helpful. Maybe having a document that's your wish list of reading and crossing it off as you go, and then you can keep adding references that you come across in there as well. I'm a terrible person for having a notebook and writing down a random reference in it, and then never looking at that page again and forgetting it so don't do what i do uh, yeah but i think definitely my thing that i say to all my students i teach is just be aware when you've got enough as well and i think also write throughout as well don't maybe i think it's useful to have your like a flurry of collecting if you like but you, that you can also you will help yourself by writing as you go as well because I just think it helps you to form your ideas much better and you start to sometimes see you've got a narrative when you're writing that you didn't think you had or you, something that you think might fit somewhere else or that raises a question about a different kind of source to look for so writing at the same time as well. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Has anyone got maybe one final question? And as I said, Aggie, if anybody um, thinks of something or they're, they're looking for a source that's vaguely history, medicine, history, psychiatry related, then you've got my email. Um, I'll write in the chat as well again, um, just in case. Um, but I'll send you those slides as well, Aggie, so that you that can share them. That's fantastic. So if yeah. anybody wants to ask a question about um, those kind of sources, then very happy to help. Jennifer, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk and it's so interesting seeing yeah, this rich history. And I think it will, yeah, much inspiration for horror related things <laughs> still, I think, in many different formats. Yeah. So thank you so, so much and, and keep in touch. Will do. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited to see what everybody comes up with. Yeah. Oh, thank you. See you Bye. later, Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks.